Amen. Okay, so if you remember in Ephesians chapter 2, towards the end, I believe in a verse, starting with verse 14, Paul's talking about the wall of partition that was there to keep the Gentiles out of the, the temple. The Gentiles could only go so far. And they could go into in the, the outer court area. So if you see the temple, you know, the, oh, our TVs are not working or something? Oh, they are there. Okay. So if you have the court of the Gentiles, you have right here, and they could only stay in this area. And so when, uh, if you remember when Jesus turned over the money changers' tables, it was in this area because that's as far as they could go. And it was very offensive to Jesus because here you have the Gentiles. They could only go that far, and they would come and they would have their, their offerings that they, would, uh, they had to exchange their money, and then they had to purchase a Passover, a, a lamb or what, uh, whatever they are, I'm going to be sacrificing, and the um, the exchange rate was inflated, so they were getting ripped off there, and the price for the animals were was it was extremely high, and it was a racket. I mean, they were making money off of worship, and the Gentiles who were coming there to to worship were getting ripped off. And Jesus was very, offend, he was very upset. And in, in probably one of the few times, he, it happened at the beginning of his ministry and at the end of his ministry, it happened twice, where he cleansed his father's house. <clears throat> That's what made him upset. That's what made him very mad. And he turned over the tables, he made a whip, chased them out, and he was upset because of what was happening you know, at his father's house. So... The Gentiles, they could only go so far. They could only come up to that area, and right there, that was happening. So in Ephesians chapter 2, what it says there is that there is no longer a partition. There is no longer a barrier. Now, that was just one of the barriers. That was for the Gentiles. Then you had the court of the women, where the women could only go so far. And then you had the court of the regular, you know, the, the Israelites, the men, they could go so far. Then if you were a priest, you could go so far. And then only those that were selected to go into the temple to minister the, uh, the things that, that was done each day when they would go in there and burn the, um, they would get the, the incense and then they would put it on the, the table of incense and burn, and burn the incense and go over there and, and uh, all the things that they did on a regular basis they could only go so far. And then there was a, a veil that separated the holy place from the holy of holies. And only the high priest could go in there once a year. And there were all these separations. And you, you could see that there, the veil right here. Only The high priest could, could only go in here, in this area, once a year. The regular priest, every day, they would come in here and they had, they had the, the altar of incense. And they would... Take, they would get the coals from off of the brazen altar, and they would get that special prepared incense, and they would burn that, and it, it pictured the prayers of the saints. You know, and you had the table of showbread, and they would, of course, they would trim the wicks on the uh, menorah, and they would do that uh, every day. They could only go so far into there. So you had all of these uh, partitions, all of these separations. But when Jesus died on the cross, we know that the veil of the temple it was one of the, the main partitions. It was removed. So in Ephesians chapter 2, it says this, and I'll, I'll just read this. For he is our peace, who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. So all those walls of separation that separated us from the presence of God were removed. See, Ever since the Garden of Eden, back there, back in those days, and 
Adam and Eve could, they came to the Garden of Eden, and the Bible says that they spent time with the Lord every morning in the cool of the day, and they were able to fellowship with the Lord. Until what? Until one day they, were, they weren't there. And God calls out, and he says, Adam, where art thou? Adam, where you stay? No, God knew where he was. But what happened? They ate of the forbidden fruit. Adam, did you eat of the fruit that I told you not to eat? In fact, God said, in the day you eat thereof, you will surely die. You know what the word death means? Separation. You're going to be separated. And Adam said, uh, the woman, <laughs> the woman that you gave to me, I didn't ask for a woman. I didn't say, can you make me a woman? But no, it was your idea. You brought this woman to me and she gave me of the fruit and I just ate. It would have been funny if the Lord said, well, did she, did she uh, force it down your throat? So he blamed Eve. And we have that, we've been having that problem ever since, right? The blame game. <laughs> but the word death means separation. And ever since the Garden of Eden, when that happened, sin has separated us from, from the Lord. And so now, you know, when Adam and Eve, they tried to fix their problem in their own works, right? You know, they knew that they were naked. I mean, they ate of the forbidden fruit. And so they sewed fig leaves together to try to fix their problem on their own. But that wasn't going to work. It, wasn't, it was not going to cover their, their nakedness. So God had to do it. What did God do? He killed an innocent animal. An animal that didn't have, didn't do it, you know, he's just doing his own thing as an animal, and then he gets slain. And then God has t had, he, had, he took the skins of the animal and he covered their nakedness. And so then what happened? Adam and Eve had to leave the presence of God because he did not want them. Oh, there was another particular tree in the garden called the tree of, tree of life. And God did not want them to partake of that tree of life and live forever in their sinful condition. So in that story, of course, we have the picture of the atonement, the innocent for the guilty, that innocent animal. Of course, pictures is a type of Christ. And how the Bible says, wherefore is by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin. So death pass upon all man, for all have sinned. But even though while we're in, in a time where even when we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And then the Bible says in Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 5.21, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. The innocent for the guilty. So that innocent animal had to be sacrificed in order for their sins to be covered. And then in that we see the picture of the atonement. And that pictures what, what Christ has done. And so there has been these, this separation ever since. That, that has been the dilemma of, of mankind. How can a sinful human being approach a holy God? He cannot. He, if he tries to, he's going to immediately be killed. And so God devised, of course, he knew what was going to happen, but he devised a way for the sinfulness of man to be dealt with. But he couldn't just overlook it. He couldn't just say, don't worry about it. I'll overlook that. I mean, can you imagine being witnessing a court of law where, where someone did a horrible crime? Maybe they ab abused a child. And then the judge says, you know what? I'm going to just overlook it this time. Just don't do it again. You would think, what? No, that person needs to pay. Justice needs to be served. And the Lord, he is not an unrighteous judge. He is a, he is a righteous judge. And so he has to deal with the sin. 
Sin has to be paid for. The Bible says the wages of sin is what? Death. What is death? Separation. So there has always been that those walls of separation. But the gift of God is eternal life through who? Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. He is the one that removed that wall of separation. So it says he is our peace because we are at enmity with God. We are at war with God. And so he is our peace. He allowed us to have peace with God. So when you got saved, you were at war with God. Now you're at peace with God. Why? Because of what Jesus has done. So last week when we looked at that, he is our peace who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace. So he, re he removed that, that partition, he removed that wall from us in order now that we can have a relationship with him. And in doing that, he made, him, he made a new man. And that is a reference to the church. Or you could say that's a reference to the Christian. That's, that is in reference to what we have today. Now today, we don't have in the church the distinction between Jew and Gentile. We don't, we don't have a, a, like a list of all those that are Jewish in, in our church and all those who are Gentiles. Now, that's, there's, there's no longer that distinction. Now, in the Old Testament, there was a definite distinction. And there was a lot of important factors that went into those that were being Jews. Number one, that they were circumcised which was a sign, the seal, and the symbol of the covenant that God had made with, with Abraham. So you had those that God chose, and right after the Tower of Babel, you see all these 70 nations of those that, and that represented all those that were in the world that were sinners against God, and God selected one nation through one person, and his name was Abraham. At the time, his name was Abram. And God called this one person, and he said, I am going to give this man and work through his descendants to bring about the salvation of all of the world. And that's the Jewish nation. And through the descendants of Abraham, through his seed, and God made a covenant with Abraham. And who knows what that covenant was called that he made with Abraham? Anybody knows? The Abrahamic covenant. Makes sense? <laughs> so I told you I had to go sleep early. The Abrahamic covenant. And in the Abrahamic covenant, which is unconditional because he puts Abraham to sleep. We might go there today. I don't know if we will have the time to, to go into um, that, that passage of scripture. But he makes a covenant with Abraham, which is unconditional. And he promised Abraham blessing, seed, land. The land of Israel that God has unconditionally given to the, the Jews. It's their, their land given to them by God. And uh, blessing, he says, I will bless those that bless you. We as a nation need to continue to be allies with the nation of Israel. And sometimes by some of the things that we're doing lately, you, <laughs> you're sitting here wondering, are we still allies with them? Are we still supporting Israel? We need to pray for a peace, pray for the peace of, of Israel. And so he promised to bless him. And then the most important one, he promised that through your descendant, through your descendants is going to come forth the Messiah. And the world will be saved. Or those that receive him will be saved. So, blessing, seed, land. It was three things. And that's what makes up the Abrahamic covenant. So he is our peace who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall partition between us, having abolished in his flesh... He gave his body, he gave his blood, and he made peace. One new man, that's a reference to the church. Now, the church is not mentioned in the Old Testament. It's not mentioned. In fact, if you study the Old Testament, when you study the 70-week the se prophecy in the book of Daniel, the, the church is not mentioned in there, and that's why the formula, or when you're adding up all the, the years, doesn't, doesn't work out, because there's the church age, which is not mentioned in there. 
Because if you think about it, technically, God is going to, he's going to implement his plan, and then the Jews are going to receive their Messiah, right? And everything is going to happen according to how God designed it. Now, God knew they were going to reject him. So there was that, I guess you could say it, it's not kind of a weird way to think about it, but God had to implement plan B. So you don't see it in the Old Testament, but you, it is revealed in the New Testament, and that is the church age. So that's what this chapter is talking about, basically, the church age or the church. Okay, so when Jesus was crucified, the veil of the temple was rent. Now, I'm going to read this, this, this uh, scripture. Matthew 27, verse 50 and 51 says, Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. And the earth did quake and the rocks rent. So the rocks are a testimony of the crucifixion. You know, like when I build rock walls, because I do that on the side. <laughs> but if you ever talk to a rock wall builder, there's a veins in these rocks, and they know how to, you know, they know how to break the rock and when they make the rock walls. And that's a testimony of the resurrection. And the rocks were rent. And all the things that happened at the resurrection, this was probably one of the most significant that the veil. Now, we're thinking, okay, the the veil was rent, you know, is, you know, this, like a curtain. The veil was very large. So the veil represents the separation of, it represents now the separation of a holy God from sinful mankind because our sins have separated us from God. In fact, look at Isaiah 59.2. Isaiah 59.2. In fact, you could probably just quickly put it up there. See if I can beat him. Ah. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. So, we see in the temple, there was this huge veil. Now, the size of the veil was, it was 60 feet long and 30 feet wide. So, it was 60 feet by 30 feet, and it was approximately an inch thick. And it was so massive and so heavy that how many priests... Do you think it would have? Do you think it took to manipulate or to move this this veil? They had to like open it, or when they had to work with it. How many priests do you think? Ten priests, twenty priests, three hundred priests to uh, manipulate it, so that there was no way that somebody, a human being, could have just did that. But when Jesus was crucified, the veil was rent. And what was significant, it was, it was rent from top to bottom, which si signifies that God is the one who ripped it. Religion tries to, tries, religion is basically man's attempt to get to God. And it would have been man trying to rip it from the bottom to the top. But God ripped it from top to bottom. When Jesus cried out, it is finished with a loud voice and yielded up. When, when, he, when he died, the veil of the temple was rent. And it says specifically from top to bottom. You see that? Verse 51, behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. So we learned that. Now, there's one mediator now between God and man. We don't need a priest. We don't need a 
a tabernacle. We don't need a temple. We don't need a, 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 an animal sacrifice, right? Back then, it was man's dilemma because of the sin, the separation. They needed all this. That's why when he gave them in, in, in Exodus, when they went to Mount Sinai, then Sinai, you, you, you were given all of the commandments. They were also given Leviticus because they couldn't keep all the commandments. They couldn't even, rem- can you imagine even r- being able to remember 613 commandments just to remember them, let alone to obey them? There was no way. You had the, the, the civil law, the ceremonial law. You had all the, the uh, dietary laws. You even had laws about how to treat a mother bird when she fell out of the nest. You had all this. But now there's one mediator between God and man, the Bible says. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1-5, through 5, it says, I exhort therefore that, first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be, be made for all men, for kings, and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all good godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have who will have all men to be saved. What is God's will? (laughs) It is his will to have all men to be saved, not just a select few, right? It is his will to have all, for all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. Okay, so in Ephesians chapter 2, we've seen that, that because of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, that he removed the partition, which was, symboli- uh, which was symbolic and typified in all those partitions that we mentioned. No matter who you were, whether you were a Jew or a Gentile, or if you were a man or if you were a woman, there was some wall there that separated you from God. If you were a Gentile, is the first one. If you were a woman, is the second one. If you're an Israelite, is the third one. If you're a priest, is the fourth one. But even if you were the high priest, you still had a partition there. You were separated from God. The Bible says, "For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God." No exceptions. Everybody. And Jesus, when he was crucified through his death, burial, and resurrection. All those partitions, all those walls of separation were removed. Now what does the Bible say? That we have the boldness to approach. What is it? How does the wording say? That we have the boldness to approach the holy place. Even if you're a Gentile, you could go into the holy place boldly. We could boldly approach his throne. And find grace to help in a time of need. You and I can go to the Holy of Holies. Any time. From any place. And approach his throne. And bring your petitions. Because there are no partitions. That's a good. That make a good shirt. Yeah, make one. Where's Jeff? Make one shirt. Bring your petitions because there are no partitions. Or that'd make a good rap. <laughs> okay, so that's the introduction. Everyone said, oh, we're going to be, and we, we're going to have to finish this in the afternoon service. <sighs> no, don't worry. The rest of it's even longer. Nah. So now... We see, I'll give you the points, just in case. We see explanation. Paul's going to explain some things. He's in prison. He's in prison, so, you know, he's going to explain some things about why he's there. We see explanation, 1 through 6. Eternal purpose, 7 through 13. We see extent. Oh, that's good, man. Hope we get at least that. Then we see evaluation. Verses 20 through 21. 
So explanation, eternal purpose, extent, evaluation. So Paul's explaining some things. He says, because of that, Neil, there's that wall of partition. It's been removed because of the death, burial, and resurrection. And so he wants everybody to know. <laughs> Paul says, it's my job to let the Gentiles. I want you guys to know that you're not excluded. You're included. The walls have been removed. So he says in verse 1, begins like this, the explanation. For this cause, I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you, Gentiles. He says, because of the fact that there are no walls, it is my job to tell you that you are included. You're included. There's no more walls. And I'm going around and I'm telling everybody this. And because of that, that's why I'm in prison. But he says, I'm not a prisoner to Caesar Nero. He says, I'm not a prisoner because of that. Now, you may be going through something today. You may be in some kind of a situation that's difficult. You may be going through a trial. Paul was in prison, and he was, away, he was waiting trial. But he says, I am a prisoner of Jesus Christ. I am in prison for him. Maybe you're in the RAM program. I'm in the RAM program for Jesus. You say, well, I'm, right now, I'm in going through this difficult situation. You're, we're going through that difficult situation for Jesus Christ. And so that's what he's saying. He says, it is my job to go and spread the word. And I'm trying to tell, you know when, you remember when Nicodemus, we're, when we're studying the book of John, and then Nicodemus was talking to Jesus, and Jesus says this, he said this, he quoted this, um, which is a very famous scripture, John 3, 16. When, when he said, for God so loved the world, Nicodemus kind of, but like it was taken back. Because the Jews felt like God only loved, loved the Jews. <laughs> and Jesus said, God so loved the world. That's everybody. And so Paul is saying, when when he went to Jerusalem, if you remember that, he wanted to go to Jerusalem for the feast. And they told him, Paul, don't, don't, it's not a good idea. It's not a good idea for you to go to Jerusalem. And Paul says, you know what? Even if yeah, I'm, ready to, I'm ready to go to Jerusalem and, and whatever happens to me, he says, I'm, what, even if it costs me my life, he says, I'm going. I'm going to Jerusalem. And you remember when he got there, there was already some tension concerning, I mean, Paul Wherever he went, there was difficulties, there was tension, because he just, he attracted that. And when he comes, when he comes to Jerusalem, there had already been a lot of talk. And people were saying, oh, Paul, are you talking trash about the, te about the temple? Paul, are you talking trash about Moses? Paul, are you talking trash about being a Jew? He's saying that you don't have to become a Jew. It's not, or being a Jew, is, that's nothing. And there is, there is this talk going on. And so when Paul shows up, and he came there because there was a famine in the land. They were struggling. He took up an offering, right? He has, I mean, he has a love offering to give them. And he shows up, and he goes, I have this love offering to give you. And they go, oh, right on. Thanks, Paul. So they take the love offering, and they say, wow, that's awesome. Okay, now we got a bone to pick with you. Oh, wow, what's going on? Well, there are some people who are saying that you're talking and saying all this bad stuff about, the, about Moses, about the law, you know, all this kind of stuff. He's like, no, no, they're just misunderstanding. So we already had to settle the Jerusalem council that, no, that somebody, in order to become a Christian, they don't have to become a Jew. And they, they were the ones that were there. He said, that was what was discussed. You guys, you, you remember, remember what we talked? That was an issue. And that had to be settled. And he said, all I'm doing is spreading the word. I'm just letting everybody know how to be saved. That you don't have to become a Jew to become a Christian. It's not. Step number one, become a Jew. Be a convert to Judaism. Step number two, become a Christian. He says, it's only step number one. And they were saying, okay, Paul, 
No, Peter, he knew. James was the leader of the church. He knew. They knew what the truth was. God already worked on Peter's heart, but there was so much pressure, right? There's all this pressure. So they're saying, hey, okay, Paul, but you know what would be a good thing? Just to keep the unity. You know what would be good? There's some young men, they, they, they've taken upon themselves the Nazarite vow. Now, you don't have to, in the, you know, obviously, in the, under the new covenant, you don't have to do all these things, but there's a transitionary time period so just to allow this transition to take place, there's some people that still, you know, they're, they're, it, this is new, so they're still adapting to this or learning about it. He says, so just to keep the unity, Paul, you know what would be a nice uh, gesture? If you took them into the temple and took some of this money, you know, the love offering, and pay for their vow. They took upon self, themselves the Nazarite vow and to, get, to pay for the sacrifices and to all the expense that was involved with the Nazarite vow. Help them out with that. Then that way people see, oh, yeah, he's not like against the, you know, the, all these things. You know, he's, he goes, it would just, it would help for the unity. Paul was, he was concerned about unity. So you know what Paul does? He went ahead, he goes ahead and he does it. And when he does it, he was set up. Now, remember I, just, I was just joking and I said, oh, oh, James and set up Paul. <laughs> But it wasn't that. But there were people in there that when he went into the temple, he had these young these men who were Jews. He went into the temple, and he was accused of taking Gentiles into the temple. And when, when they were yelling and screaming, he's taking Gentiles into the temple, everybody got worked up, and then there was a riot. And so then when, when the... The temple police got involved to squash the riot or to, you know, deal with the riot. They took Paul, and they didn't want, you know, they were there, it was their job to protect him and to bring him into protective custody. And when they were bringing him in, Paul said, hey, hey, hold on a second. Do you mind if I just say some things to them? And so the, the captain of the, the temple guard said, go ahead. And then he gives his testimony, right? And he says in his testimony, God has called me to tell the, to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. Oh, and when he said that, they just... <laughs> they, for real, they did that. Did you see the movie? They got upset, right? And oh, they had to just whew, had to take Paul away from that scene. They were upset. So they take him into Caesarea, and he's well, waiting trial. And you remember he stood, you know, he had to stand trial before Felix and Festus and all of that. And he appealed his case to Caesar. So that's where he's at right now. So he appealed his case to Caesar. So he's in prison, but he's under what they call house arrest. During the day, they allowed him to go. You know, he could go walking around. He could go and, you know, and enjoy the sights or whatever, you know, of Rome. And, but at night, he was chained up to a guard to make sure he wouldn't escape because, you know, they were making sure that he would, would um, stand trial. And so that's, where, that's what's going on. And so while he's there, he says, I'm not a prisoner of Nero. I'm a prisoner of Jesus Christ. He has me here for a reason. And while I'm here, I'm going to write the book of Ephesians. I'm going to write the book of Philemon. I'm going to write the book of Philippians. I'm going to write the book of Colossians. And he's writing the books of the Bible. He says, Jesus has me here for a reason. And while I'm here, I'm going to write these books. So he's explaining to them his situation. What's going on with him right now? So he says, for this cause, I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, I'm a prisoner of Jesus, it's his will, but I'm doing this for you because I'm trying to get the message out to the Gentiles that Jesus came to save you. For God so loved the world, the middle wall of partition has been abolished. It has been a removed. Now you have open access to him. All you have to do is receive Jesus Christ. He says, I'm here for you explanation verse 2 
if ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God. Dispensation. It's just the way that God is dealing with the world during this time period. So there are different schools of theology. And you could, there's all kind of probably different, I guess, you, uh, differences in between these major schools of theology. One of, one of the, the schools of theology is called covenant theology. Okay? Covenant theology. Those are the ones, a lot of times, a lot of the real intellectual um, preachers fall under that. A lot of them that, like, how many have ever heard of, of Jonathan Edwards? How many have ever heard of, um, probably even Spurgeon, probably? I'm not, and then there's divisions in the, those that are covenant theologians. That's different, though. That right, right there, that's, that's it's. If I was to explain it, take too long probably. I can just simplify it, but there are different covenants. But when we talk about covenant theology, they're not, it's not talking about that. In fact, that's mostly what's funny is those that are dispensationalists follow that pattern. But I don't want to get in too much into it. So you have the um, covenant theologians or those that practice reformed, uh, uh, reformed faith. And then you have, those, you have those that are dispensationalists. Those are the correct ones. Because that's what, I, that's what I believe. I'm a dispensationalist. And then even in dispensationalism, you'll have different, you know, you got even some that, that are hyper-dispensationalists. And so I don't want to get into all the different things. But you have different schools of thought. You have covenant theologians, and then you have, you know, dispensationalists. But the word dispensation is here. And a, as a dispensationalist, you have the dispensations right there, and you have the time period, you know, of innocence, of conscience, of human government, and how God worked with the world during that time period. And the reason why he works with the world differently is because of the sinfulness of man. Like God worked with the world as a whole. When he worked with when Adam and Eve all the way up until you have the, the Tower of Babel. And at the Tower of Babel, remember when I said God chose in one group of people. Now it's going to be different. And he's going to get the message to Abraham and through the, through the Jews so that they can get the message out to the rest of the world. But God has always been concerned for the whole world, from the Old Testament to the New Testament. It's just that he's done things different ways in a sense because of how man has responded. Okay, so he says, if you have heard of the dispensation... Of the grace of God, which is given me to you word. How that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in a few words. So he already talked about, when, I, when we talked about this in chapter 1. But he's, he says that God has revealed this unto me. Now remember, Apostle Paul is an apostle. And he always had to defend his apostleship, right? And he is an apostle, and the reason why we say that, I and mean, he said it, he said that of himself, but an apostle is someone that got the message straight from the source, right? Do you remember when, when Judas Iscariot had to be replaced? And they were going to, they were going to, um, when they found their, when they were looking for the replacement for Judas, there was qualifications that had to be met, Right? Do you remember what those qualifications were? That the person had to, that was replacing uh, Judas, they've had to been around for the ministry of Jesus Christ from his baptism all the way to his ascension. They had to have heard with their own ears the message from Jesus Christ, right? And so... You say, well, how did Apostle Paul hear when he wasn't even saved at that time? He explains it in Galatians that when he got saved, he says, I didn't go to uh, um, Peter. I didn't go to the other apostles and have them explain to me. He says, I went to Arabia. Some say it was Mount Sinai, that part of, uh, of Arabia. And I was taught by Jesus Christ himself. So that's why he's an apostle. 
He got the message straight from the source. If someone says they're an apostle, now I, I know that the word means messenger. But if someone says they're an apostle, that they carry that office, and some, some churches will say that. That's not true. An apostle is someone that heard it straight from the source, and they also had the authority to write scripture. That's why Paul, who's an apostle, wrote scripture. And the other apostles, they wrote scripture. Or, like in the case of uh, the book of Mark, it was John Mark that wrote it on behalf of Peter, who is an apostle, right? So he's saying that I got this message straight from the source. If you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given to me, to you word, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery as I wrote afore in a few words. I know all about this mystery because I heard it straight from the source. And he's going to explain what he's talking about. Whereby when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Okay. In English, a mystery is something dark, obscure, secret, puzzling. What is mysterious, it's uh, something that is hard to see. Like if you're watching a mystery movie or reading a mystery novel. But in the Greek, the Greek word mysterion, it's different. It's still a secret in a sense, but is no longer closely guarded, but now it is open. More simply, mysterion is a truth that is hidden at one time, but, re re but revealed at another time. So it's hidden in the Old Testament, revealed in the New Testament. And one of those mysteries is the church. That's why you don't see it in the Old Testament. When some people say that, no, there is no particular church age. It's always been, and they always go to the same passage, the passage of Scripture where it talks about the church in the wilderness because the word church is used. Well, it's just talking about where there was a lot of people. There was a congregation, people that were gathered together. But that does not mean it was a New Testament, a local New Testament church like what we have now. But that's what they're, they're going to they're gonna say when, when they talk about that. But Paul is saying that, there is a, that this is a mystery. Which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of man. In other ages, in the Old Testament, it, wasn't, it was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets, by the Spirit. Okay, what is that? What are you talking about? That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. That is a mystery in the Old Testament. It is revealed in the New Testament by his Spirit unto the apostles. It's not that somebody can just make up stuff. Well, you know what? The Holy Spirit said this. This is a new truth. No, you have to be an apostle. You have to be proven and tested and tried, and Paul, Apostle Paul was. So you can listen to him. They didn't have a Bible back then, right? They had parts. You know, back then they didn't have. But now, when that which is perfect is come, then that which in part is done away. You know what? When people, if you ever tried to figure out in the book of Corinthians, when it's talking about when that which is perfect is come. How many has ever tried to do that study to find out what is it talking about? You have when when that which is perfect. Let's see if we can. Oh, uh, no. Uh, we'll talk about afternoon service. <laughs> when that which is perfect. And people always say, what is that? That that which is perfect. What is the perfect thing? Right. What is that perfect thing? I've never been comfortable with any answer I've ever heard before until one day it's like i figured it out and i'm the only one who knows <laughs> <laughs> but that which is perfect is come and people would said that's the word of god now we know the word of god is perfect but is that is that what is in reference to 
And so I talked to a good friend of mine who was very, very wise. He's a pastor at the road, Brother Skip Woodfin. And we talk about things, ask him, what do you think he says? I read commentaries, and you, you, sometimes you read 10 commentaries, you get 10 different answers about what, that which is perfect. And you know, at one point, it's just like I was, stu- I was teaching because they have a college, a Bible college. By the way, it's going to be starting up in August. If you would like to join a Bible college, it's free. But you have to have the days available, the classes. The college is free, and then we have good teachers there. And um, anyway, I teach at this college, right? And I was studying. I forget what book it was. And it's like the Lord spoke to me that what I just read, verse 6, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. To me, that is what is the perfect thing. Right there. What God has done through the Holy Spirit and the word of God the mystery that is revealed and how he has begun the church. That is what is the perfect thing, in my opinion. I mean, I may be wrong, but you know. there was one time I was wrong. Remember I said 19, when was it, 80? I was wrong because I thought I was wrong, so I was just wrong about being wrong. <laughs> just joking. But well, Jim's leaving. He's like, I'm out of here, man. I'm gone. <laughs> But do you see that there, the explanation, what Paul is saying? He's saying that I'm here for you Gentiles because I'm preaching something that the Jews, they can't accept a lot. Now, remember how God worked on Peter to get this truth to Peter? I mean, he was on the rooftop. He was hungry and he was kind of dazed. And then he brought, and he had a, he had a vision of these, of the, of a sheet coming down with all these unclean animals, right? And he told Peter to arise and eat. And what did Peter say? Not so, Lord. I mean, the Lord told him to eat, and he said no. You see, sometimes our traditions and the way we've been brought up, our background can be so powerful that when God tells us to do something, we won't listen to God because of the traditions we've been taught all our life. You know, like I was raised in a Catholic church. You know, I was raised a Catholic. And when I became a Christian, There were some things that were different than what I was taught all my life. No, I'm not going to be loyal to what I was taught all my life if it's not the truth. (laughs) I and you and I need to be loyal to the truth. And so Peter, he listened to the Lord. And what the Lord was telling him is that I want you to go and preach to Cornelius. And he's he is seeking. He's searching. So I told him to send some guys to your house over here. And I told him to, uh, um, to look for a man named Peter. And he's staying at a house with a guy named Peter. <laughs> or Simon, yes, yeah, Simon, right? Simon, a tanner. He's a, he, he tans animals. He's already in an unclean house-type profession of a guy that has an unclean profession. And they're gonna, you're going to get a knock at the door. Go with them. So he gets a knock at the door. He goes with them. He goes to Cornelius' house. And what does Cornelius do? He bows down and starts worshiping Peter, right? And Peter says, no, 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 stand up. Don't worship man. And he preaches to him the gospel, and Cornelius and his household get saved. And that right there was a type of or picture of the church. You had Jews and Gentiles in one house together, and Peter preaches, and they get saved, and they receive the Holy Spirit in the same way. And Peter witnessed it because he was at Pentecost. He preached at Pentecost. Now he's there at like a Gentile Pentecost. But there's just a household of people. And he preaches and they get saved. And he saw and he came back and told the other apostles. He said, you know, the same thing that happened to us at Pentecost, the same thing happened in in Cornelius' house. And he said, nah, yes, no way, for real, nah, no can, yeah. For real. And Peter was saying, he was understanding now what God was doing. And so now God was showing Peter what he was doing. And then you remember the situation that happened? When, um, when, when Peter was, when they were up at um, Antioch, and then you had all these people coming up, Peter, uh, all the, 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 the big guns from Jerusalem, and there you got 
Peter eating all the, he was eating with the Gentiles. He's having a blast. He's eating, you know, shrimp. He's eating scallops. And then, and then John them comes, right? And then Paul's there. And Paul de, and John them come. And then Peter's like, <clears throat> and he walked over to the kosher table. He started eating all the kosher food. And, and then Paul said, Peter, you stupid or what? <laughs> oh, and, and he rebuked Peter. You remember that? See, Peter had to, he had to learn. He had, this was difficult. I mean, they were brought up one way, learning all of these things all of their life, that the only reason God created the Gentiles was to fuel the fires of hell. So it was going to take, it was going to take a little bit of teaching. And so we see that that's, that's what, what was happening. So now Paul is saying that I am a minister. It is my job. He is, now Paul was a Jew. I mean, he was a, raised a Pharisee. And he says, God has called me to get the message out to the Gentiles. And because of that, that's why I'm in prison. But I'm not in prison. Don't feel sorry for me. I'm a pri- This is the Lord's will. And while I'm here, I'm going to write these letters. And while I'm here, I'm going to do all that I can. Because he said already, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. Whatever I got to do, wherever I got to be, whatever the Lord has me do, I'm doing it for his honor and his glory. And he's going to explain more about that, but we're just kind of out of time. It's just it took too long to listen today. And then I went on like 10 rabbit trails. <laughs> so we see explanation, right? And then we see, don't worry, I'm just buying time for the chili to come. That's all. It's on its way, so we just got a little bit. I get them on GPS, okay? It's still, it's still in Kaikili right now. So you think about how much more time left? Six minutes, they said. Six minutes we got. You guys got six minutes in you? Five and a half. You good? So the first thing is Paul's explanation that the Gentiles, that's a, that's a mouthful right there, that, that verse. Are you seeing it, though? He says, which in other ages, Old Testament, was not made known, is hidden unto the sons of men, as it now, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles, which Paul is, right? Peter, right? God has revealed it to the Peter. Unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs. There's one body now. It's a new body. It is new. It is the church. That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. Then we see verse 7. The point is eternal purpose. God has an eternal purpose into what he's doing. Whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles, the unsearchable riches of Christ. He said, it is my job that God has given to me, even though, I mean, we know his background. He persecuted Christians. I mean, he ended up consenting to the death of Stephen. Do you remember that? You remember when Paul came to Stephen's house? Oh, no, they're rabbit trail. You know when Paul came to Stephen's house? Who is it? Paul. Paul who? I used to be, okay, used to be Saul. How come you calling yourself Paul now? Trying to go undercover. <laughs> no, he didn't say that. I'm Saul of Tarsus. Oh, you don't want it? You the one that consented into the death of my best friend. Yeah, sorry about that. I'm changed now. 
And I don't know how the conversation went, but what did Philip do? He brought him into his house. He took care of him, right? Because Philip knew he's a changed man. I mean, if God could change, what did Paul say about himself? He says that Christ Jesus came into this world to save sinners of whom I am chief. That's why he says this. Unto me who am the least of the least. No, he says, who am less than the least of all saints. He says, I'm the worst. Oh, but you don't know what I did. Paul says, yeah, I don't know what you did, but do you know what I did? I hunted down families. I had them go to prison. It was, I was so passionate that I wanted them to be put to death. And I felt like I was serving God. He said, that's how twisted my mind was. I was trying to, I wanted them to be put to death. I consented to the death of the godliest man you could have ever met, Stephen. And I consented unto his death. But I saw him when he breathed his last breath. When he breathed out his last breath, it was for forgiveness. He said, forgive them. Lay not this sin to their charge. And he died. He said, and when I looked at his face, it didn't look like someone that I've, he said, I've seen many people die. I've seen, I've consented unto the death of many people. I've never seen someone with that kind of expression that he looked like he had the countenance of an angel. And he could never, he never forgot that. And God kept convict. Remember it says, when, when Jesus is talking to Paul, it's hard for thee to kick against the pricks, the conviction of the Holy Spirit. He said, you can never forget Stephen, can you? You can never forget what Stephen, what, what he looked like, what he said, what he sounded like. You knew you were wrong. You still went with it. You killed him. You need a change. You're on the wrong side of things. He says, who are you? I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. When he was persecuting the, the people, he was really persecuting Jesus. And on the road to Damascus, he gets saved. He says, I am unto me who am the least of the saint of the, I am less than the least of the saints is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles. But isn't that what grace is? God's riches at Christ's expense. He says, I don't deserve this calling. But none of us do, right? He has saved us and he has given us everything that we are fellow heirs I mean, we inherit. Imagine if one day you found out, someone called you up and he says, hey, I need you to identify yourself, you know, because we think you may be related to so-and-so, that you may be the last surviving heir. And he was a billionaire. And there's nobody else. There's nobody else to, to sign for all of his wealth. And it has been left to you. You'd be like, wow. He says, that's how we are when, we, when you got saved, we are joint heirs with Christ, fellow heirs, he says. And what we're going to inherit is far more valuable than all the, in fact, Jesus said, what does it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? If he shall gain the whole world, all the riches of the world is not worth as much as one human soul. So we are joint heirs with Christ. And he says that I have been given this that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which the beginning of the world hath been hid in God who created all things by Jesus Christ. Oh, and it, gets, it just keeps getting better. So I encourage you after our lunch break to... We have still the eternal purposes, the extent. We have a great picture of the cross in this passage. And then he evaluates it in the, in the, the last point, verses 20 through 21. And then we see an illustration in the Bible of what God is saying in this passage. So we'll continue that after lunch. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? With heads bowed and eyes closed and no one looking around, the first thing is most important. Do you know?